Yep. Kaya. Long. Hello, everyone. Um, it's good to see so many faces interested in this kind of natural occurrence, like birds, etc. Um, we're totemic people. My name is Lynette Knapp, by the way. Um, my daughter, Chandel. We're both Miriam Yorwis, uh, Menang women. We belong, belong to the coastline from Denmark River in the west right through to the Great Bight. Um, from the ocean, the sea in the south and its islands, right through to the end of the Dajarat boundary, which is the Blue Mallee. That sits on the ancient seabed that, and we call ourselves the shell people that belong to that area. And my eldest auntie was born in Israelite Bay and my father was born in Albany. The other eight were born all along the coastline, so we're true coastal people in a sense. Uh, the, the mighty Yurikarup River is Yurikarup, so people that are interested in birds, birds we became, were called Yurit, or our totemic bird is a Yuri Yuri, so the Yurikarup River is the Yuri Yuri. Yurda, or Yurda, for the bird, and Kat or cart up for the shape of the head in the Jetacutup lakes. So we're truly, well and truly entrenched in our country. Um, but I'd like to take this opportunity for you, you know, to say welcome to country and hope that this thing will enlighten a lot of people, including myself. And um, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks very much, the next four parts. Um, and we now lead on to a, a group dis in presentations and discussion about focusing on walking together, bringing Indigenous knowledge and Western science together for caring for country. So I'd like to initially hand over to um, both Shandell and Alison um, to get there, and then we'll, we'll move into um, other presentations and the panel discussion. So can I hand over to you now, Alison and Shandell? Thank you. How do you want it? Okay. Yeah. Standing up. <laughs> Make me stand up. Morning, everyone. Um, so. Uh, just one more thing I just want to add in terms of housekeeping is that Susie needs to leave early because she hasn't seen her family for two years and she's got the opportunity to fly out and see them. So if you see her disappear, that's where she's going. She won't quite stay to the end, but hopefully we can have some of the panel discussion before she goes. Sorry, can I um, put this onto your, uh, just onto your, onto your phone, is that okay? Yep. Yeah. So... Um, do I need to stand away from that now? No. Um, so this morning we're just going to, the four of us, between us all, are just going to, I guess, showcase a little bit of the work that we do with our research team here at UWA in Albany, um, our cross-cultural two-way learning sort of um, program that we have going, and um, all of the four of us, so myself, Annie Lynn, Chandel and Susie are all sort of um, parts of it in various ways. So um, Chandel and I, first of all, are just going to share a few examples of, um, of how this approach, this two-way approach, has um, really given us some insights into biodiversity conservation, um, primarily by talking about, um, I think we have five different plants that we're going to go through as, as examples. Um, So, yeah, first of all, I just want to acknowledge that we're here in, in um, Merninga country and, um, and acknowledge all of the elders who've been involved in this work that we've done. 
um, yeah, and for the contributions that they've, they've given to us. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so Shandell's going to give you a brief, brief over, overview about Meninga country, then we're going to talk about some specific um, plants that we've worked together on, um, and then really just a quick wrap-up of you know, why, why this sort of work is, is important in terms of, or we think it's important in terms of what we do. So there you go, I'm going to hand over to Shan. Okay, so um, you'll notice in the welcome that Mum did, um, talked about how we are connected to country and parts of country. So we pretty much associate ourselves, we call ourselves mirroring us. So pretty much translated, which I think is translated to, is those who eat me. So everyone knows that the plant mean, the blood root, is traditionally or predominantly from Albany. So if you actually think about where that plant is located, it sort of really means those who eat mean, so specifically those who are from Albany. So that's where our strongest connection is. But traditionally our country is in um, or what we call Meriniga, is inclusive of Menang, so over in the Albany section and we go as far as Denmark or towards Warhol. Yep, Denmark River. And it goes all the way through to Israelite Bay and the start of the Great Australian Bight. Um, also uh, our boundaries are um, uh, the tundra, which is the Blue Mallee. Um, so we know if we go as far as where that is quite evident, um, then we know that we're still inside our country. So when we see that, we know that's where we are. Yeah? What else do you Did you want to talk through there? Um, so the project that we've been working, um, or the projects that we've been working on with um, Ali and Steve and Susie and Ursula and others, um, these are a couple of the photos um, that sort of demonstrate how our intergenerational processes happen. So um, on the left you'll see a photo of Mum with Steve. Who's that in the back? Mum. Uh, and my, old, my brother, who's the next one after me. Um, in uh, a process where we're doing intergenerational transfers but we're also sharing that information as well in an open and transparent process. So up the top is our um, baby brother undertaking fire processes out at Boxwood. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, so mum uh, directing him in um, the processes that he needs to undertake. This photo is um, of Nanny Bonnie overlooking that Oakland. Hope Town. Um, so it just shows the, that big area, so I think that's, where's that one? That's on the um, Wilson Inlet. Inlet. Yeah. Wilson Inlet, then Boxwood, then Hope Town, and then this particular photo is of me taking a photo, um, <laughs> and our youngest uh, borrowed child, um, that's at Israelite Bay. So that shows the extent of the projects that we've been working on, and, and the information that we share as well. So, yeah. Oops. There you go. Do you want... Oh, man. <laughs> Stop playing with it. <laughs> uh, there you go. Do you want to talk about Yulk? Well, Yulk, most people will know what Yulk is. We call it the bush potato. Um, but it's actually bush tackle for us. So um, it's one of those... Um, plants that have sort of, sort of tuckers that has become quite um, widespread and known about um, fairly recently but it's one that we've been use, using for quite a long time um, and Ali's done quite a bit of work based on uh, your report. Mm. So um, I first went out, uh, my first experience with York was with Annie Lynn and, and Annie Carol Pedersen and they um, we went out and we dug some up and tasted it right there and then and I think we had it in some coleslaw that <laughs> night as well and um, yeah, so um, I spent um, a reasonable part of my PhD looking at this, this plant then. Um, so you can see there that's Annie Lynn and I, Annie Lynn's giving me instructions on how to dig it up there. 
Um, yeah, exactly. She's very good at giving instructions. <laughs> Um, so you'll notice, yeah, um, veggie gardeners in the room might notice the flowers look a bit familiar. It's in the Apiaceae family, so, um, so you know it's in the same family as carrots and coriander, parsley. Um, so part of part of what I did during my PhD was I looked at the genetics of yolk, so which is Platysarchy deflexa, and um, looked at it. Um, and compared it with another um, plant within the genus, Platysarchy effusa, um, in terms of basically the genetic signal, looking for whether we could see any signal for to, to indicate this long human interaction that this plant has had. And um, two things, I guess, is that it's really quite um, homogenous across its range. So this map over here shows the haplotypes, so all the unique um, genetic sequences that came out of this, this um, genetic study. And you can see that pretty much beside from that darker green um, circle over near Esperance, all the other colours are represented at multiple populations. So it has this um, kind of homogeneity and there's a lot of shared um, haplotypes across populations. So that's one thing that's really interesting. And then the other thing that we found is that um, so this shows the haplotypes in relation to one another. So the top one is Platysarchy deflexa or York, and the bottom one is Platysarchy effusa, which is this other um, closely related genus, uh, closely related species that has no known Noongar use. It doesn't have a tuber at all. And you'll notice that the patterns are quite different there. So this is like their family tree, you can think of it as. And you'll notice that if you look at Platysarchy deflexa, it's like they're very closely related, so they're like, you know, brothers and sisters or cousins or maybe second cousins at the most, whereas um, with Platysarchy effusa, you know, it shows this much more distant pattern. Some are closely related, but there's other, you know. So I kind of like to think of it as the top one's a little bit like a, a, um, a small rural town where everyone's kind of related to one another, <laughs> whereas Platysarchy effusa is probably more like a, an apartment building in a city where there's people from all across the world living in that apartment block. So um, I think that's pretty interesting in terms of um, potential interactions with Merninga people. And I don't know, do you want to comment? <laughs> uh, no, you're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. So in terms of the homogeneity, we talked about them being moved around and like how they're, how they're how used. They're so and pretty much you would only go そのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのそのその
two years later. So we went, so harvested them 2015, then harvested again 2017. And by that time, the tuber size hadn't actually got back to what it had been pre-harvest and the, and the actual quantity, which I think made sense to you, you guys and your family. Yep. So, I mean, it's pretty much a species we'd use for any educational process we undertake, sharing information and knowledge. So, if we go and harvest to do those sorts of things and even eat it, then we'll use locations on a rotational basis. So, yeah, it definitely fits in with that, how we're taught to harvest it. Yeah, yeah. and I think, um, I think, Annie Lynn, um, you might have talked about uh, maybe every four years around about, you'd go back to a to a site um, oh, yeah. when I... Because the um, travel distance was so far apart, you know, every time you get back there would be approximately about that. That mm -hmm. process, yeah. and, and it's a life skill. Aboriginal people are all about life skills. So everything that they harvested or, or where, where they knew where to go and harvest was to keep their, their lives going. And, I mean, Australia's not like 5,000 years old. I had an upload group that told me I, my connection was 75,000 year connection. So for all the many, many years, my family would have taken that walk from Denmark right through to the other day and back. So I guess the two years that we did for this experiment was just a bit short. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Didn't walk far enough between sites. Yeah. But what we did find was that um, there was this renewal process going on. So definitely what we were pulling out two years after were nice little baby ones that were really tasty compared to these big old woody ones, which again, I think is what you would expect. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that harvesting of the tubers really has this renewing effect on the plant. Um, the other thing that we found is, so yuk grows ac across a range of habitats. It sort of it grows on um, sort of mainly in sandy sandy soils, but will grow um, in more sandy loam. Um, it will grow around granites and so on. Um, so it has a range of habitats. Uh, I've also grow seen it growing on spongelite just near, near Twerd up in the fits. Um, but what, what we found was, um, was that it seemed to yield more in more fertile places, which I guess kind of makes sense. <laughs> and and it, it maybe points to that, um, you know, you were saying about certain places being targeted, yep. Shen. Yep and favourite places, like the place that you took me to initially, initially Annie Lynn, was a favourite place that you guys go back to. Easy. Yep. 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 Um, did you want to talk any more about harvesting yolk? No, I think. Yep. Okay. The only other thing I might add is that when you get to the root system, the main root system of the plants, which is showing there, those little yellow Runners are the ones that you follow along. You can't find them unless you find some. <laughs> so generally we leave the stem yeah. in situ so it stays and then we follow the root system. Yeah. And then you pick the plant which is you can get in quite a big circumference there. Yeah. Yeah. And and the main thing to to know about Aboriginal of Brackalo Tucker, Bush Tucker, is everything is um, it needs a host. Everything that you need to host to, to survive. So when you see clearing of lambs and you're killing the oats, you're killing everything like that too. All right, so we're going to talk about another plant now, which um, both Ani, Lynn and Shan have already mentioned. And I'm just going to add that that beautiful artwork down the side is Shandell's artwork. <laughs> and um, you might recognise it if you've been to the Alison Hartman Garden and seen the, the um, little garden around Makari there. Um, so we've already talked about tundra being our boundary indicator. Do you want to...? Well, my, most plants in, in, in Blackfellow and I mark boundaries. So if you're travelling, going a long way for travel, and your countryside changes on the side of the road, 
You know you're in someone else's country. You know you're in someone else's country. So with us, when we're out of that, we know. But I um, used to take my dad out of the country every now and then. So when we come back, it'd be pretty late. You know, but we to sort of Perth or somewhere, or up the country more the other way that didn't have too much data on. And he'd sit up with, and watch the headlights and every time one of these would start shining, he'd go, oh my girl, I'm home. <laughs> so that's how we feel about recognising our Buddha, our country. Um, and it drives, I've always taught people, I've always told people, like I was told, this is my dad, that this was our, where our land started and began. And it only grew on the ancient seabed. So the rolling waters that are happening now, uh, it was there before. So there's no need for alarm to just move the house. And it's out of Tundra country because it, it grew on the ancient seabed. And we were down at Thomas River last week. And um, there was a quarry, someone dug a quarry to put on the roads. And you can actually see all the fossils, in, and it was quite away from the ocean. And um, you can actually see all the shells and little sea creatures in all these rocks and things. It was wonderful for me because I was sitting back watching everybody fossicking around and you can actually see the sea level from that little bit of a cutout. So it just rings true to me, it just proves every now and then that the things that I've been taught, it'll pop up. You know, you see them way out away from the ocean with the tiger right there. But we also got another, we've got two other tiger right, one's a lamb's paint, and you can find that, it's got a red, long red nut on it. Business. Uh, and if you look at the green as well, Piram, or Param, Tigerite, green. And it marks the boundary where we've been, at Thomas River and Israelite Bay, is the main area for the Noongar person. The people, the Noongar come out of Israelite Bay, and the Noongar isn't everybody, like we refer to it today. I don't like referring to Noongars. Um, because the Noongar is a man that's been through two sets of law, lived out, lived right, and his country is bounded by the wind color right. And I think it grows in a, in a circumference of about, a radius of about 450 kilometers of his country. So we've just got it up on the screen now, Annie Lynn. So what Annie Lynn's just described is something that she'd been told by her dad about this green tallyurak that grows over near Israelite Bay and the story about its association with the men and the warriors. And so when we went over there um, and with Steve as well and we were able to actually see, you know, Annie Lynn was able to see that and we were able to, you know, show and, and see that there's this correlation between these two species that are very closely related. Um, so I guess that's, you know, another example of that traditional knowledge and the Western science coming together. Yeah. And it wasn't until I went there with Lydia and Steve and Shani that it, I saw it. I uh, made a difference. It's just an amazing experience. So this is another plant with another lovely one of Shandell's artworks. Do you want to talk about that one, um, Shan? So the Cyclops, uh, red-eyed wattle, more commonly known as. Um, for the, us, this is another intact species. It pretty much tells us where our grandmothers and our mothers would have camped prior. Um, they would have used the, the seeds, um, ground them up, um, and uh, put it into fish, added it to fish. So it was more nutritional value for the kids that were eating the fish. So most of the waterways are along the coastal stretch, you will see this plant um, because it would have been carried um, so it's quite prolific now. Um, and we also use the green uh, seed as a soap as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, it, it grows mainly 
around the coastal areas. Um, and Ani Lin said to me that um, it's an indicator of campsites, which makes perfect sense to me because it just pops up all the time where you would expect people to camp. Um, and this, um, this site here in particular at the top is a place called Kala Willup near Jaramungup. And it was a really, this is, uh, I visited there with, um, with um, some elders and that really brought, brought it home to me. This, um, this Kala Willup has actually, doesn't only have the red-eyed wattle, but it also has three other really important cultural wattles that are all big staples in terms of food sources and it's, a, and it's an important campsite. So that was just one little illustration of all of that kind of coming together. Um, it grows, um, it's a really, it loves fertile areas and it um, responds really well, <coughs> excuse me, to fire and enjoys disturbance. So it grows in those places where, where people tend to camp. <coughs> um, there's also a little bit of genetic evidence to indicate that it's also got this real homogeneity across populations as well, which would also fit with it being a really important food plant and, um, and being carried and brought back to camps like the way that you talked about. Don't yeah. try it. Don't try it. <laughs> and Annie Lynn doesn't like it. She doesn't like the taste of it. Um, so this is another really nice example of, of um, some kind of understanding that's come out of us working together. So this is a plant that Ani Lin told Steve about. Um, do you want to tell us no, no, what? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so it's one that um, her dad had told to her that's used as a fish poison or as a poison for game as well. Fish yeah. Game. Yeah. And she just said, oh, it's a grass and it has blue flowers and it grows in this spot. <laughs> so Steve was like, oh, I wonder what that could be. So they, they um, went to this spot together and had a look and <clears throat> Steve was able to identify that this was the, the plant, that, the, the um, name of the plant, sorry. So we could put a scientific name to this plant that Annie Lynn knew really well from her family experience. Um, and you see this growing on lots of lots of granites, it's a, it's a granite endemic. Um, and here it's growing just near the site that we, um, we, sh we so showed in that first picture at Wilson Inlet. So it's sort of a, an important place right near the coast where people would be catching fish and so on. So um, it kind of begs the question like, this is growing really prolific in this place. Is that like an indicator of, of it being um, close to fish traps and being really intensively used and therefore there's an, another extension to that potentially being quite frequently burned and so on. So there's, there's all these sort of other questions that we can explore, I guess, and yeah, things to, to, to talk about in terms of where this plant grows and the sort of how human interaction is. Yeah. You, they used to bruise it and put it in special places where there, there's fish and the fish used to upside down, so they used to take the fish. Um, and also, uh, in the Nama foyer, in the rock holes where there's water, they breed, they breed it and put it in that as well. So if a kangaroo or a possum or something got down and added in the water, they just stumbled. Yes, body stone, easy catch. So it's quite useful. <laughs> So I'm conscious of the time that we want to try and get um, Susie in before she has to disappear. So we're going to keep moving on. Um, if this thing will work. Yep. There you go. Do you want to tell us about Mudja? Do you want to come in our conversation? Yeah, okay. Let's come in. Yeah. So yep. another... another um, uh, culturally significant um, plant, but we can share more information when we have a chat. Yep. 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 Um, so why is all of this important? So we all know that we live in a biodiversity hotspot and, um, whoops, and, um, you know, it's just a little reminder that there's, there's two reasons it's a hotspot. There's the good reason that we have all of this extraordinary 
plant diversity in particular, but a lot of that plant diversity is really threatened. So that's really the key message there. <clears throat> and then that's just highlighting that, you know, on the ground, you know, that's three really important places for Merninga people that are all looking pretty degraded in those photos. And um, I really think that sort of situation wouldn't happen under Merninga traditional management. And so this is why we're doing this work together um, to try and um, prevent some of this kind of stuff, I guess, and to work out how there's a better way. Um, so Shan, did you want to have a final word? Um, I think that um, <coughs> the project that, that you, Mum's been working on for quite a while and I've sort of come in as a bit of a takeover, try and shut Mum up. <laughs> but a big focus for us over the years has been about us sharing our knowledge and this project has provided us with a perfect opportunity to be able to give people our knowledge but not just that, we also benefit from it as well. So the stuff we learn from the people that we're working with um, makes us go, oh okay, so that's why that makes sense as well. So not just for non-Indigenous people, but also for us as well. So um, I think uh, having these sorts of projects to participate in really help us um, uh, share and learn at the same time. Um, so now we've just got um, some photos that we're just going to kind of talk to as a group. So I'm just going to pull that one up. <coughs> With the um, uh, lizard traps, would you like me to... The lizard traps are generally used down here in the autumn. The ones in the country that we mainly use most of the, most of the time in the year round. But down here in, in Buona, when autumn and uh, winter's coming in and it's gone cloudy and wet and there's bits and pieces of sunshine coming through. It's when the red poles have to come out in the sun, it's sort of on those banks to get the cows from the rock, sun in the rock, and they'll sun themselves to, it, to get enough power or energy to get on the ground. And once they uh, get that, that average, the black on the wall, maybe, I've used this as, as a kid growing up, we've used these little traps, so it's very important to weed them like they are. Um, so that when the old buildings to come in, the traditional fossils come in, they come behind whatever was selling itself and are frightened under that little trap. And that was how they were harvested. Big sources of food and life, life skills. Um, no, that's okay. So, so this is a spot um, you guys hopefully recognise and it's um, and it's a spot where you see lots of lizards but they're what you would call little colouries aren't they? <laughs> Annie Lynn do you want to describe what a colourie is and 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 where this so so people may be familiar with this place Annie Lynn would call it colourie rocks or and and we might also know it as Calurup near um, the Fitzgerald River National Park yeah. on the western end. Yeah. When we were kids, we used to camp not far off here. And going on our way down to the coastline, mum and dad and Aunt Kathleen's um, carrot fish and some other fish here. And they had kids at one stage, so we would need to pull up the kids. Yeah. And it, it's um, the funny thing that we, Carol and myself took Arison when he was about 10, 9 or 10, on a, on a trip down to Thomas. Thomas River to have a look. So I'm like way back according to Cullery Rock, what we would call Cullery Rock. Because the little lizards that sit up on the rock, and these ones, they sort of sit here, do this and wait for you, you know. So when we were kids, we used to all jump up, all us kids, and we'd be running, all going, chasing all these cullerys everywhere. They're, they're funny looking, so they'd get up on two legs and they'd go, you know, go for it, and we'd be running behind it. And it was funny because when Carol Harris and I fall in there many, many years after I was a kid and, and um, Harrison was asleep in the little bus we were in 
and pulled up and went, oh, and he looked at this bloke, this kid had never been there in his life. And he got up and woke up and he looked out the window and then after comes the door and he's running. <laughs> <laughs> he's running from one end, of, one end of the rock to the other. It was quite a big rock. And he said, where's Harrison? Oh, he's over there. Where's Harrison? Oh, he's up there now. So he's just running like we used to do. Um, and I, I um, this day when I visited with Annie Lynn and Harrison and Susie and Steve, I think was probably a really, really happy day for me as well because I grew up on a farm right close to here and it was almost like an extension of our backyard. We used to go there for picnics all the time. Um, so I think we probably spent time running around chasing those little dragons <laughs> on the rock as well. So it was just really special to, for me personally to go back with Aunty Lynn and hear the Knapp family stories of that place. And, and we call them curry because they it's <coughs> kind of the same colour as whatever environment they're in, but the other word, the proper word is, is cutting. Cutting. So. Um. Okay, so this is, um, this is just another aspect of the sort of work that we do. So this is on the um, Vancouver Peninsula or Kinjaling Taling, um, and here's Chandel teaching some of the students. So um, do you want to share about um, Kinjaling Taling? Or Chandel can talk yeah, about yeah. teaching, um, whatever you... Well, I mean, everyone knows that referred to as point possession. Um, so pretty much you go along point possession walk, um, the heritage trail, and you've pretty much got everything that you want to share in a short time frame about Aboriginal culture. So we've got plants along the way, we've got spaces, we've got stories, we've got um, hard evidence, so um, murmurs and um, artefacts, lizard traps as well. So um, we've also got petroglyphs up there as well. So we pretty much get Aboriginal culture, including history, in one setting. So it's a key location for us, especially when we're doing educational um, talks, um, that we use it. Mum used to run up those hills, but she can't anymore. <laughs> so um, pretty much I'll come in, um, especially when mum's doing, um, you know, weeks or days, especially with uni students, um, and I'll do the walks um, with them and then do the uh, knowledge sharing as well. So that's part of my role. Again, it's about reiterating those intergenerational knowledge transfers. So we're all doing this while we're participating in a process. Right? So I'm learning stuff every time I go out with mum. I'm still only 21, but um, <laughs> there's this process that's happening um, that no one else can see. Yeah? So um, these areas and uh, these opportunities are, are quite significant for us. So we say we, my family, is to say Kim, Darling, Carolyn, to refer to this place as the tongue. Kim, Darling, we call our you know, it means place of rain, but Carolyn is tongue. So we, the elders is referred to that as Kim, Darling, Carolyn. So. Um, most people have agreed that this is one of the places that is up for dual naming. So they're calling it Mamangkura, which means whale heart. Um, but for us, um, yep, um, we're, we are taught to refer to this location as um, Kinjaran Kain, which means Albi Tom. Mm. And so um, Shandell here is talking to the students that you can see there. Are, um, conservation biology and environmental science students. So we're really kind of bringing into their learning this um, traditional knowledge that the Knapp family and other um, families in Albany um, hold and to give them that exposure to that traditional knowledge and for them to be thinking about, about how that fits and how it's important within their own paths and careers as conservation biologists and, into and the future. A bit, a bit of a pity. Because, um, it's relatively out of touch 
other than a few footpaths going through um, towards all our sites and things. And then what made my skin call last night was watching the news and seeing the car race playing for us. Mm. Why? You know, we, we are so untouched, we don't need car races up there. They're just mm. disturbing everything, including the spiritual aspect of it, they're killing it. Um, so we also had a lizard trap there for Susie to talk about, but uh, I think um, we've already talked about lizard traps, so um, what else have we got? Um, so this is um, something else that's sort of come out of Susie's PhD, actually. She mentioned about um, the really strong education component that comes with caring for the cultural aspects of, of granites in particular. So. Um, part of what's evolved out of that is this um, learning a language and culture course that um, we've had one pilot and we're just about to have another, haven't we? So uh, run by Annie Lynn and Chandel and um, basically this is, this is it, sitting all fairly relaxed in the little gazebo at the fish traps and all learning about learning a um, language. Yeah. yeah, this is probably our opportunity to boss Susie around a lot more. Um, but um, having this opportunity as well has been really good. Um, we focus on Miranda or Menin language, um, so it's, it is different to Wajak language, which most people prominently they use Wajak language in most things. So um, we focus on Miranda language, um, and we run a ten-week course um, where we go through that. So we start with. Aboriginal culture, why we are the way we are, because everyone wants to know why. Um, then we progress through to language and specific words for our language, not for Wajja. Yeah. So um, again, another great opportunity for us to be involved in and, and share. Um, Miranin, a language is always been referred to as a lost language, um, but as we progress through it, we sort of see that it, there is potential where it could actually be the original language, so, yeah. We were talking about the type of species that what Denise said. So we've been doing a little bit of work with the Noongar Buja Language Centre, um, who um, is run by ling linguists who are able to do all sorts of fancy analysis on what they're told by Ani Lin and, and her cousin Ani Gale, who've been working together with them. And um, basically what's come out is that this Merninga language is um, really quite in a very pure form, as, as the linguists say, and not, um, not kind of contaminated by, by words, no. more modern words coming in. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, just listen to the thing that I said is Noongar country and what Noongar means. And now that's been used widely and not used properly as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that's filthy, the filthy is up most of the language. And I say filthy because it's, they just use words without. I'm, I'm not a Noongar. I wouldn't take that off my grandfather. See on it. This is like a magical mystery tour because I can't remember what I put in here. Sorry. Oh, here we go. So we can talk about, um, about cultural burning. Um, so here's a couple of examples of some burning that we've done with Ani Lin. And um, that's Ani Carol Pedersen there and Ani Lin, Ani Lin's youngest son Harrison there, Shandell's little brother, um, at where I live at Boxwood Hill. Um, and I guess what you can see is it's a real family kind of affair you know you can't see any dogs in those pictures but there were dogs running around as well so there's kids and dogs and everyone and it's all you know pretty relaxed and chilled I don't know if you want to talk to I, that I, one I, 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 that's why it's wonderful sitting back and being allowed to do this on someone else's property you know just to teach them the basics like what we used to do walking as kids but I tell Harrison that you look like you're going to about to spear me sitting there <laughs> <laughs> but the, that's the way that we used to do it, do it steady. 
and do that all over the country. Then come back a couple of, you know, in a few months and then you spread the ashes out, which is encourage seed new growth. New growth. And the fact that it is so sort of small scale, low key, everyone can be involved. It's just this wonderful teaching opportunity. So you can see there, yeah, Annie Lynn's pointing and giving Harrison directions and telling him what to do. And over here, Annie Lynn's actually teaching um, my daughter when she was a few years younger and, um, and another little granny how to cook a body that they'd just found in an acacia tree. So there's the the, the cooked body before it got consumed there. So it's just this um, really fantastic organic way of sharing this knowledge among generations. Yeah. 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 Do you want to talk, talk <laughs> about that one? So tying <laughs> all these oak warriors, most people refer to them as. Um, we believe that these are the um, the last of the warriors that have been left behind to look after country. So these are quite prolific through the Fitzgerald River National Park where we have a, a very deep connection. Um, so in the background you'll see what do you call it? Dakata. So, Dakata. Dakata. So um, that is a range that we um, are also uh, have spiritual connection to through a storyline um, that goes right through the bits and I think it goes all the way to Alice Springs, that particular story that like, connects up with other stories that link up. Um, and like this range, um, most others, especially like Wurra Wurra, we're taught not to climb those ranges. They are highly spiritually significant, um, so we don't disrespect um, them. Everyone knows about Wurra Wurra. So. More and more means totem spirits. So we believe that when our totems, when we die as our totems, we go out to Borongor, which is the place of totem spirits, Borongora, Borongora. Yeah? So we're taught not, we're not allowed to climb um, those rocks. Yeah? Um, but the oak warriors are quite um, a significant plant for us. So we see those, we smile. And also we call mountains and significant hills, we call them part. Part. So when I'm country, we know they've got mid eyes, they watch us. So we're not worried about what your parents are watching, you know, they're doing wrong. So we act respectful, we don't climb it, because we don't sit on our people's heads. And that's another thing that annoys me, halfway and stuff. Mountain of the fresh water, not, not the salt water, the fresh water, we we call pizza. Pizza. You hear a lot of people talk about our pizza on pizza. But what what pizza also is this mother's milk. Mm -hmm. So life giving. Um, and that's what we talk about our country and our belongings to us. We're totemic people, like I said in the beginning, we're totemic people. So, and we've got two totem seeds that of an animal, and that of a plant or a tree or whatever, a plant. And so that makes us, we, we belong to them. They don't own us, nor do we own them. We belong to them, so that makes us a, an important part in the ecological system of Australia. Mm -hmm. And the majority of oldies that are still left today should know how to feed it. And, but the sad thing about our, our culture is it's going from very western off. And we need to do this kind of stuff with beautiful people like Alison and Steve and Susie. Ursula, we need to do all these beautiful things with beautiful people that can record this. And that's what's happening. And so um, I'm just going to add one more thing quickly, and that is um, that it really makes sense to me that how Shan and Annie Lynn are talking about not climbing hills and not going to these places that are really sensitive parts of the landscape. So, you know, um, these are really, you know, we talk about. Southwestern Australia being a biodiversity hotspot. Well, these 
These spots like Dakatar or West Mount Barron in this area around are really the, the hot spots in the hot spot where the, the biodiversity is really peaking, I guess, and it's also incredibly fragile and vulnerable. So it makes perfect sense that you wouldn't <laughs> that you wouldn't go there and yeah. Then my aunt is that the live that would have a fire. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So one last slide, and then we've got a little movie show. Yeah. yeah. So um, just one one last slide. So this is at Cheetan Up or Point Anne. Um, people might be familiar. So this is the St Mary's Inlet, and I'll let Annie Lynn or Shan take it from there. Well, this is pretty much a fish track. Yeah. Really. Um, most of the time, you can go there now. We go there quite often. Um, that's all actually underwater most of the time. Um, but if you see where it's running along where we're standing, um, so that is Lena, um, there's little holes in there. So people would have been grinding up the camps and stuff and it will attract fish. So the fish will come in and then when the tide goes out, they're stuck in this particular area. So where we're standing just there is here. Or in but the, the, the whole fish trap runs around in a round circle and you can see it just peeking out of the water. So when the tide goes out, so when the tide comes in, it washes all the crabbing to the middle or the shellfish or whatever is our bait. Um, and then um, the fish will go in and then when the tide goes out, they're stuck in that fish trap there. So it's easier to get. So it's a, it's a real, it's a proper working fish trap. Um, predominantly most of the time now, it's underwater, um, but I've got, yeah. We got it on a good day this day, so, yeah. Mm. This so is part of the So even those holes there, they're quite deep once you turn it all out. Yeah. You hang it on them, they go back there and clean it out. And if they are fish in there, they would be in there. You know, all the, all the holes. And people don't recognise our fish traps. They only think we've got stone ones with you around here. So that's a fish trap. We've got stick traps. We've got stick traps out of um, King River. That, um, that, what's that stuff there for? Northern on King. You go around there at low tide, you can actually see the stick traps across the other side of the river, if you, but you've got a really old look. And what it is is two lines of sticks. About, it's a place safe and far apart. And what Grandfather, it was my family that used to erect those, that particular fish trap. Grand, grandfather was quite famous for it. And what happens is you get weed and you thread it through, and, and it's quite long. Thread it through, so when the mullet coming down the river at great speed, they jump the opposite on straight to the other. And it was always um, fish for the family. And talking about grandfather, he was also what they used to call a doctor man. He used to stand way steep from this coast from here all the way through this right bay. When the salmon was on the run, it was always grandfather, he was the only person that could do it. Um, out in the water, way steep and slapping the water and pulling the dolphins in and he loud. And the dolphins used to come in and burn all the salmon up on the beach. My, my dad reckoned it was quite a sight just watching all the salmon jump out of the water. And all the black horses used to come along and grab whatever they needed to take out. But he, grandfather was always, uh, he, was, he used to box in the Albany Town Hall. He fought there for 11 years undefeated, beat his body. And so when he used to get in trouble over that end, over the east end there, Instead of bringing him on country, because he used to knock the fleece out and take off, um, they used to put him on the boats that used to bring the wool bales or whatever around the cutters. And once, they, you know, a couple of times they used to stick him on islands. Mm -hmm. so one island in particular is called Boxer Island, and it's quite a way out from Esmond, and he used to swim up there. Using the dolphins for shark protection and the reefs, the dolphins pick up over that water. And the quite strong swimmers, 